We'll get started. As I said, uh, this is special with the crowd size. We'll make it really informal. So if you have any questions, if you say, hey, tell me more about that, just raise your hand. You're not going to bother me. If you leave, I will be offended. <laughs> I know that's against podcast rules. I really don't care. Um, just a little bit about myself so you guys have some contacts. My name is Doug Smith, born and raised in Pittsburgh, uh, grew up in Wexford, went to North Allegheny. Uh, I had a crazy background. I uh, was a drug dealer in high school, graduated with a 1.6 GPA, never thought I would amount to anything in life. Uh, my dad's a bus driver, so I just thought, hey, I'll be a bus driver like my dad. And there's nothing wrong with that, obviously. But that's as big as I could dream of my life. My senior year of high school, my mom actually passed away, long story short. When she passed away, I had a family come into my life that became mentors to me and showed me an entirely different way of life. It ended up being my wife, wife's family, and, um, and her father works at Carnegie Mellon, and he grabbed me and he became a mentor in my life, and he said, Doug, you're going to do something with your life, you're going to go to college, you're going to make something of yourself, let's go. Uh, I tried to get him to CMU, he's the dean of admission there, that, it didn't help. Um, so uh, I started TCAC. I went to Robert Morris. Uh, I ended up on staff at a church for a few years in youth ministry and then got a job at Light of Life Rescue Mission a few years later. So that's where I currently work now. I've been there for six and a half years. If you're unfamiliar with Light of Life, we're a nonprofit on the north side and we help the homeless. Um, and I do fundraising for them. And I also oversee outreach. And then uh, another thing that I do, which is where I'm presenting from today, is my wife and I developed a leadership development company called L3 Leadership. And we, uh, this was really formed because I had mentors come into my life at a young age. And uh, again, like my father-in-law, poured into my life. And they brought, they gave me great resources. So hey, listen to this audio book. Here's some books for you to listen to. And what I'm talking about today is they exposed me to great leaders. They would bring in leaders from around uh, the county. And they would say, Hey, when I bring in this leader, I want you to ask them questions. I want you to ask them out to copy and ask them to mentor you. And uh, I want you to learn from them. So I started doing that with leaders for about 10 years. And I loved it. I've always been fascinated by learning. And I've met some very cool people through that. And after 10 years, my peers started saying, well, wow, Doug, like I wish I could spend time with so-and-so. And I said, well, you probably could if you just asked. Uh, but a lot of people are afraid to ask. So I'll talk about that today. Um, but I saw it as a need, and so I thought, what if I started recording my, uh, my conversations with leaders and made that a podcast? So in 2012, I started the L3 Leadership Podcast. So I've been podcasting for five years. It started out uh, just being me interviewing leaders on a month-to-month -month basis. Uh, then we, we launched our company, and we started hosting a monthly leadership series uh, where I bring in leaders from the community to share their best leadership content. And we record those talks and the Q&As with leaders. And we put those on the podcast, and then once a month, I put a personal, uh, I do a personal leadership lesson, and put that on the podcast as well. So, podcasting wise, if you're interested, we're about 164 episodes in. Uh, I love podcasting; it's opened up doors for me that I could never imagine. And um, I've interviewed some really, really cool people. Yesterday, I've interviewed all three coaches of the Pittsburgh sports teams. Yesterday, I finished off the trifecta. <laughs> I, I got to go down to UPMC and uh, interview Mike Sullivan in his office, which was like. Oh man, is that a bucket list? I don't. But again, I say all that because I never, as a, a 17 year old kid, I never dreamed that I would spend time with anyone. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today is how do you get a meeting with anyone? How do you actually build a network? How do you just start where you're at? And uh, I like to be very practical, so hopefully you walk home with a lot of practical takeaways. Uh, if you guys really care about slides, I'm horrible at, I'm used to people doing slides for me, so I probably won't remember to like switch any. Uh, but if you want to copy the show uh, or the slides, uh, if you just fill out the, the connect cards, I'll email you a copy of everything we talked about today. So let's get started. Uh, how to get a meeting with anyone. Just a few thoughts. Earl Nightingale said this. He said, the difference between who you are now and who you'll be in five years is the books you read, the, the people you associate with. And in today's world, I'm sure he would have said the podcasts or the, the lessons that you listen to. And again, I am where I am today in large part because of the network that I've built and the people that I've been able to surround myself with. And so first and foremost, I think your, your heart is, is one of the most important factors in getting a meeting with anyone. Um, people can sniff out pretty easily whether or not you're just trying to use them or if you genuinely want to connect with them and add value to them. So I'm going to talk to you a lot about attitude, but I want you to think about Take away getting a meeting with anyone just for, for your podcast or whatever. I want you to just develop a hunger for growth and a hunger for mentorship. That's really how I got started. 
right? I don't meet with leaders because I want to say I met with Mike Sullivan. I want to meet with Mike Sullivan because I want to know what Mike Sullivan knows. I want to learn from his experience. I, I, to be honest, I, I don't. I would interview Mike Sullivan on my own by myself if I didn't have a podcast because I'm naturally curious. So I'm never going in with a motive of, oh man, like I need something from him or I want to take advantage of him. And I want you guys to think about diversity too. Um, don't just think about getting mentors or meeting people in your specific field. Uh, a lot of the feedback that I've gotten, uh, what we do at Delphi Leadership, is people love that I interview leaders from the business world, from the sports world, from the, uh, the religion world, from government, all kind of leaders. And so the one thing I'm going to encourage you guys to do is create a bucket list of people that you'd like to interview. And maybe you just want to create those different categories. So government, education, nonprofit, and then just keep a list. I use uh, the app Wonder List, which is just a, a, an app list with a to-do list. But I actually have lists of here's all the people that I want to interview, here's all the people that I want to spend time with. And I'm constantly adding to that list. So I never have an empty list of, of, of leads, so to speak. I always have people that I'm targeting. So again, list out all the areas and then start creating a bucket list uh, of people that you'd like to spend time with. Um, where can you find people and connect with people if you're just starting from scratch? My first piece of advice to you is to start where you're at. Start with the relationships you do have. If you look over all, we have 165 episodes, if you look in the beginning, my first interview, my first episode was my father-in-law, director of Mission Carnegie Mellon. It, right? I didn't have a large network of leaders to work with, so I started where I knew. Then I interviewed some of my friends. And then if you look at the evolution of who I've interviewed, you see it getting broader and broader and broader and more diverse. So be willing to start where you're at. And where do you find people? One, get out, uh, get out, right? Go to networking events. You can find people at work, in your family, at church. The biggest way that you'll meet people is through referrals. If, if, I could, if you don't get anything else out of this lesson, the, the thing that you should ask every single person you interact with is, is, who do you know that I should know? Never leave a meeting without asking that question. Who do you know that I should know? Who are, oh, I didn't even know went to another slide. Who do you know that I should know? Who are two or three other people that you think would be of uh, value uh, for me to interview? You'll be shocked at how many people know. You're, you're one or two contacts away from your bucket list interview. I didn't realize it, but I was one connection away from getting an interview with Mike Sullivan. I was one connection away from getting Coach Tomlin. One, in, literally, one connection away from Clint Hurdle. That's how I landed those interviews. So always, always, always ask for referrals. And then obviously go to, to networking events as well. A few thoughts on networking if you're not great at it. Uh, if you had an intel, I'm extroverted, right? I have high energy, I love people. But if, if you're not, or even if you are, here's some thoughts. One, be someone worth networking with. Be someone wor worth networking with. What do I mean by that? Are you a growing person, right? Most likely, the people that you put on your list that you want to spend time with, they're going to want to spend time with people who are intentional with their life, right? That they're going to be intentional with their time. So do you bring value to the table just in who you are, right? When I meet leaders now, I have 164 interviews worth of, of growth in me that I'm bringing to the table so I can relate to them. But be someone worth connecting with. Learn to be sharp. Shake hands with people, look them in the eye, dress well, etc. I talked about this, but show up places, right? Just show up and show up and show up. Keep going to networking events. Join Rotary. Join Toastmasters. Go to meetups. I know someone who said this. Connect it with people at church. Ask people lots of questions, right? I have a list of 20 questions that, that hey, if I meet with you, I'm going to go through them. Boom, 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 boom. And one of my, I hate when I meet with people and they start asking me questions back. I'm like, whoa, 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 no, 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 like. That's my strategy. Just ask questions, right? Because you're gonna people will become genuinely interested in you when you become genuinely interested in them. So learn to connect with them on a on a person to person level. When I met with Mike Sullivan, before we ever started the interview, I wanted to get to his heart. Hey, Mike, I know you have three kids. Tell me about your kids. Man, his, his face lit up. Man, my my boy is doing this. My girl's doing this, right? And so I connected with his heart. And so if you want, I'll tell you a story about that later. But Connect with their heart, ask them a lot of questions, and ask personal questions. And then, this is simple, but in networking, determine if this is someone you'd like to connect with outside of that meeting. Sometimes you'll, you'll think you'll be excited to meet someone, then you'll meet them and be like, yeah, I never want to meet with that person. But determine if it's someone you want to. If you do, ask for their card and be prepared to give you, them their, yours. Always be prepared to give out your card. And then follow up and create a next step. This is where most people miss it. Again, this is the ABCs of networking, but most people never send that follow-up email. 
right? I, I told you guys I'll send you a follow-up email. I promise you, you will get a follow-up email from me. Most people never do that. They collect a card, and they have a whole drawer full of, full of business cards that they never followed up with. Hey, I'd love to get together with you, and then create a next step. And then finally, get a meeting on the calendar. Hey, let's grab lunch. Uh, a lot of times when I'm trying to interview a leader, ideally, I try to connect with them before I interview them. Right, in the case of Mike Sullivan yesterday, he doesn't have that much free time. He's like, hey, let's grab lunch. But so a lot of people that you want to interview will. And then they'll want to get to know you. And then you can tell them about your podcast or, or your radio show and, and get them interested. And then you guys can kind of plan and it'll help you plan um, your time with them. Um, what else we got? I'm finish there. So, uh, there we go. So how do you get an appointment? Uh, with a potential mentor or someone that you'd like to meet with, number one is don't be afraid to ask. This is huge. When you create your bucket list, and, and when I say dream with your bucket list, I mean dream. Like Mike Sullivan's been on my list for five years. I never knew that I would earn, that's not true, he's on the picture too, but Clint Hurdle was on my list for a long time, right? Mike Palmer was on my list for a long time. Don't be afraid to ask. I don't know how many of you guys, I'm sure in this space, a lot of people know Tim Ferriss, four hour work week. Yeah. Right, I'm sure you've heard him talk about this, but when he gives lectures at Stanford, a challenge that he gives the class, he said, I want you to contact the most high profile person you can and get in touch with them within two days. Right, go after Mark Zuckerberg, go after Eric Schmidt, all of these heroes. And he said half the class doesn't even try because they don't think it's possible. And then a third of the class tries and they get okay results. And then actually a third of the class, actually, they might get an email back from him. Because you never know. You never know who will respond. It, it's it's just crazy to me how many people say they want to develop a great network, but they're afraid to even send an email or to reach out and ask or to tweet someone. Don't be afraid to ask. And that's my challenge to you today. At the end of the day, I'm going to say, hey, who are the top five in your bucket list that you could ask to spend time with when you get home today? There's a fascinating interview. Uh, if you have time to look it up, it's only a minute long uh, video, but if you just look up Steve Jobs, ask, there's a minute and a half YouTube video of Steve Jobs telling a story that he was 14 years old and he was super nerdy. He, he was trying to build something, I, I'm not technical at all, he was trying to build some kind of circuit board and he couldn't figure out how to do it, he was missing a piece. And he actually called Michael Dell, the founder of, of Dell Computers or someone from HP, he called some executive and basically said, hey, I need to know how you built the circuit board. Well, I, don't, I forget if it was a phone call or an email, but the CEO of the company, like Michael Dell or whoever it was, picked up the phone said, talked to Steve Jobs, spent an hour on the phone with him, told him how to do it, ended up hiring him as an intern as a 14-year-old kid, and he got to work for him, and the rest is kind of history. And Steve said, because of that experience, I always try to do that for people when they reach out to me. Now, in his case, good luck getting old well, dead. But you guys get the point, right? So don't be afraid. Just ask. Just ask. Come up with a plan to ask them. This is my bread and butter. Um, figure out a way to add value to them. Right, so uh, I'm a fundraiser at Light of Life, and my job is major gifts fundraising. Now, if I, I'm a, when I started this job, I was 27 years old. If I email an executive at UPMC that I want to cultivate to raise money for Light of Life, they're going to be like, okay, you want to meet with me for what? You're a 27 year old kid, you work at a nonprofit, you're probably going to ask me for money, but I'm an executive, so I shouldn't even want to spend time with you. I want to talk to the executive director, right? But what if I shave my ass, and this is this is my ask. What if my ask to that executive at UPMC becomes, hey, so-and-so, um, my name's Doug Smith. I do work at Light of Life Rescue Mission, and I also have a leadership development company, and we have a monthly leadership podcast that I interview leaders for, and I am very fascinated by leadership, and I've been watching you as a leader for, for months now, and I am very interested. I would love to spend a half an hour with you asking you questions about leadership, and one, number one, I won't waste your time. I'll send you a list of questions in advance. Two, not only do I spend time with you, I will record that interview so and then put it out on our podcast. So not only will you add value to me, but you'll add value to hundreds of other leaders. Right? All of a sudden, it, it no longer becomes, hey, there's some young kid who is impressed by my position and wants to spend time with me. It becomes, hey, here's an opportunity for me to mentor a young man or spend time or add value. And not only to him, to everyone that he influences through his podcast. And hey, when I do that, not only am I promoting myself, I'm also promoting UPMC, right? And you have a huge opportunity to add value. That is a much more intriguing ask than, hey, can I spend time with you? So find a way to add value to them before you ask. I, again, I talked about this, but show them you'll be prepared. I will send you a list of questions. Uh, I always ask for a specific time length. 
I used to ask for 60 minutes. I'm starting to ask for 30 in hopes that I get 60, but 30 is a more realistic, uh, it gives me a better realistic chance of actually getting a yes in 60 minutes with some of the people that I ask. And then just obviously make the ask. If you think before your meeting, okay, so you've asked, you get the meeting, and now you're like, oh my gosh, like, I'm going to be sitting in Mike Sullivan's office. What do I do? Ah, right? Because then you actually have to meet with them. Number one, um, I talked about this already, but before you meet with them, make sure you're on a personal growth plan. Again, just, just make sure that you're up to date and that you're a, grow, a growing person. I just think that's so important. Prepare for your meeting. Study the potential mentor you'll be meeting with. Once I land an interview with someone, I study them for, I, I can't tell you how long. I have a list of specific, I have a list of probably 25 questions that I, that I can ask any leader. I call my lightning round questions. So those are questions I'm always going to ask at the end if I have time. But then I'll, I'll, I'll research, I researched Mike Sullivan, read, read a ton of articles on him, and I said, okay, if I could only ask Mike Sullivan five to ten questions, I got 15 minutes, if I could get five, maybe ten questions in, what would those questions be based on the research that I did? And then I prepare my list of questions. Um, and then, yeah, I send it to them in advance, which, which they always appreciate. In Mike Sullivan's case, sometimes they don't want to see them. They'd rather answer off the cuff. Uh, other times they love it. I've had leaders actually print out the questions I sent them, and they wrote like all of their answers out on a piece of paper. Again, it's the preparation that really makes a difference. Um, I put this, figure out what they love and give it to them. This is one of my favorite stories ever. Um, there's a marketer, the, I forget her name, but she's the woman that created the Affleck Duck. And she got an interview with Warren Buffett. Okay, so imagine preparing for that interview. Now, to, to my understanding, at this point in, in his career, at least when she interviewed him, he'd only give people 10 to 15 minutes. So that, that's what she prepared for. I'm going to get 10 minutes with Warren Buffett. But in her research, preparing for the interview, she found out that Warren Buffett loves Diet Cherry Coke. Loves it. Like, it's obsessed. In fact, if you see him, most of the time he has one on him. So, before the interview, she knew he loved Diet Cherry Coke. She went to the store or brought a cooler. I don't know what exactly she did, but she brought a glass, in a glass, a glass uh, bottle of Diet Cherry Coke. And she sat down. She said, Mr. Buffett, I know that you love Diet Cherry Coke, so I thought we'd start the interview with something you love. Here's a nice cool Diet Cherry Coke. Warren Buffett looks at her and said, young lady, in all my years interviewing or doing interviews, no one's ever brought me a Diet Cherry Coke. You can have as much time as you want. She got an hour and a half with Warren Buffett because she spent a dollar twenty-five on a bottle of Diet Cherry Coke. Right? What again, it's just a way to make you stand out. That Warren Buffett probably never forgot that. She certainly hasn't. And it cost her a dollar twenty-five and maybe an extra five minutes of preparation. How can you add value to that leader? A lot of times I'll email uh, the people that I ask, usually I work through assistants or different people. I ask them, hey, I'd love to, to do something for them. Is there anything that they love? Uh, and, and a lot of times they're very wealthy and don't care about stuff like that. So it might be like, hey, what's their favorite charity? I'll make a donation in their honor because they're doing this for me. And then I send, oh, I'll get into follow-up later. But find a way to add value to them. And then this is just very basic, but email and call them the week before or the day or two before, just to confirm that they're still okay. Hey, are we still on for 1 to 1.30 on Wednesday afternoon? Here's my cell phone number. If anything changes, and if you can't do it, please give me a call, but I just want to make sure that we're on. Again, it's just, it shows that you're consistent and that you're intentional. Okay, so you land a meeting. What do you actually do when you land a meeting with anyone? Number one is be early. Be there as early as possible. My mentor when I was young, he said to be early is to be on time. To be on time is to be late, and to be late is to be left. And he literally would do that. Like, if you didn't show up on time, if you were late, you would leave, and you'd be sitting there by yourself. But it taught you how to be sharp. So be early, shake their hand, keep eye, eye contact. Always do an upfront contract. This an upfront contract. Hey, Mike, I know we said you, you, you'd have 15 minutes. Is that still the case? I want to respect your time. Yeah, I got 15 minutes. Okay, I will make sure we're out of here by 1.15. And we were. And, and again, respect their time. But then that way they know, hey, he's thinking about my time. They can kind of relax, not thinking, I've got to get out of this meeting. I've got to, man, put the responsibility on yourself. Uh, ask about their personal life. I mentioned this already, but ask them. I had, I had a, probably a minute and a half as the cameraman got ready to record the podcast to ask Mike about his family. Bring a notebook and take notes. Now, if you're actually doing a video podcast, maybe you shouldn't do this. But if you're meeting with someone that you want to meet with, bring a notebook and take notes. I, one, it's going to show them that you actually care and are intentional and care about what they have to say. Two, 
and it'll give you notes to actually follow up with them. So when I send thank you notes, I don't just say thanks for your time. I say thanks for your time. Here were my key takeaways, and, and I take them out of my notes. And what's beautiful about that is I didn't, you know, some people were like, thank you notes are kind of dumb. Personally, unless you write something meaningful in them, you give me a thank you note, I'm just going to throw it away. But what was interesting is I interviewed a leader one time and sent him a thank you note, didn't think anything of it, didn't see him for another year and a half. We end up running into each other, and, uh, and he said, I forget how this came up, but he said, hey, I want to show you something. And he pulls out his daily planner, and at the very front of his daily planner, he actually put my thank you note to him in his daily planner on the front. And he said, this reminds me every day that what I do matters, and it encourages me, because as a leader, it can be lonely sometimes, and I need encourage. Thank you for telling me that I matter. Now, in my mind, I'm some young kid, and this guy doesn't need encourage. This guy's tearing it up. But he keeps it in there for encouragement. You never know what one simple thank you note will do. Tell them the difference that they made. Tell them uh, what you got out of the meeting. Because why? Here's what I know that people are going to expect out of you. They're going to expect you to be teachable and to be humble. Larry King said this. He said, I remind myself every morning that nothing I say this day will teach me anything. So if I'm going to learn, I must do it by listening. Now, I need to get better at this when I interview people. But sometimes I hate when people interview people on podcasts, and the speaker, the person being interviewed, makes this great point, and then the host goes on and tries to think he has to make a better point, and he like talks about his point, and then amplifies it for like two minutes. And I'm like, dear God, I, I'm not listening to your podcast to listen to you host. Like you're interviewing this guy, I want to hear him. Now on the other end of that, can, can you, I'm sorry. Can you give like an example? Uh, yeah. I, I can imagine maybe what you're talking about. But, yeah, and maybe but, I need to be a better host. But so it's like if no. I'm interviewing you yeah. uh, or Mike Sullivan and he's like, hey, man, he made this great statement about the cup. He, he said, when I came, because I asked him, when you came into the locker room, there's Sidney Crosby, Malkin, and Flurry. How did you gain their respect so quickly, right, and not be intimidated by them, et cetera? And he ended up just saying, like, they were star, a star-driven team, but great stars don't win championships. Great teams do. Awesome. <laughs> but what I so yeah. so what I hear hosts do that annoys me yeah. is they'll say, you know what, man, that's so good. Great teams do win great championships. And let me tell you what it takes to you know what I found that makes a great team is this. And I'm like, all right, just like focus on the person you're interviewing. Yeah. Instead of just saying, yeah, that's great. That's a great point, and moving on, mm -hmm. they'll talk for a minute, and I'm just like, and they try to make a point, so they sound profound. You mean like trying to one up somebody? Is that? Yeah, that, in general. Yeah, that's just again personal preference. Now, oh no, I, I can I can totally understand what you're saying. That could be very annoying. <laughs> yeah. Sure, yeah. But on the other end, I guess I'll tell you. So I always ask for feedback on my podcast, especially from people who have big podcasts. And actually, this Monday I was speaking to a nationally known uh, leadership author and speaker, and he listens to my podcast, which is extremely humbling. And I said, Hey, man, because you listen and because you have a great podcast, can you give me feedback? And he gave me the opposite feedback. Me. He said, Doug, you have so many questions and you're so focused on getting to the next question that sometimes it sounds like you're not listening to the person talking because you're so focused on what's next. So sometimes what I do, and if you listen to my podcast, you're here, like, don't make this great answer, and I am ready to go into what's next. So instead of even being like, that's good, I'm like, yeah, that's great. No. You know? <laughs> and so I'm trying to grow in that area. But by my one reason I do that is because I don't want to be that guy. But I think there's a happy medium in there. Um, but long story short, what Larry King said is, man, spend your time listening more than talking. And, uh, and I think you show yourself being humble and teachable when you do that. Two questions that the leader, again, this is assuming that you want to meet with this person on a continual basis or take advantage of their network, etc. Two questions that they're going to ask after they had a meeting with you. Number one is, did you value what they taught you? Right? And ways that you can show them that is writing in a thank you card, you took notes, you were intentional with their time. You, you said thank you, etc. And then number two, did you do something with it? And this is more in a mentoring case, but again, if they give you a, a list of referrals, did you follow up with those referrals? Right? All too often, we go back to people that we've met with because we have another thing that we want them to do for us, and we may not have even done what they told us to do. And so just make sure you're actually executing on things that they ask you to do. And then after your meeting, how do you follow up with someone? Again, this is all just basic networking, um, but I think it will help you not only create a great network, but sustain a great network. After your meeting, evaluate your meeting. 
literally, like, I view every leader I meet with as a date. I know that sounds weird. I actually told a leader that, and they're like, well, don't say that. But, um, but I view it as a date. You know, was it as good as you thought it would be? Do you want to meet with this person again? Do you actually want to publish this? And it's really bad when you interview someone, and you're like, yeah, that was horrible. I do not want to put that on the podcast. But evaluate it. Do you want to meet with them again? Follow up with them. I talked about that. Um, write a thank you card, etc. And then create an action plan. Again, if, if, specifically, if this is for you to act on, write down all of your to-dos. If they told you to read a book, etc. And then actually do it. And then if you've decided, hey, I met with the mentor. It was great. I want to meet with this person again. Here's how you get a second meeting. And then basically develop a friendship from there. I think initially it just starts as an intro meeting of like, who is this person? But if you'll cultivate it right, it, it can become a lifelong for friendship, which is my goal for every meeting that I get with leaders. I don't, I don't just want to show up and just say, yeah, I interviewed Mike Sullivan. Like I want to, <laughs> this sounds horrible. I want to infiltrate the Penn's entire staff, right? And so how can I become friends with the Pittsburgh Penguins based on an interview that I had with Mike Sullivan? But ask for a meeting. So if I were to meet with Mike Sullivan again, Mike's probably a bad example, but if I met with a leader that I want to meet with again, I would either email them, call them, or send them a card and say, hey, I loved our, our time meeting a couple months ago. Here's what you told me to do. Here's what I did with what you told me to do. And can we meet again? If you do that, I promise you, no, no buddy that you meet with is ever going to say no. Why? Because no one does that. No one actually follows through with what they're told to do. And so actually do it. Tell them what you did with it. And say, hey, you taught me this. I learned the lesson. I need to ask you about something else. And you'll uh, develop a friendship through there. Um, and then ask for another meeting. Other than that, just a few other thoughts. Honor them. Find ways to honor the leaders. So even if it's a year after you interviewed someone, what are some ways you can honor them? Well, one thing that I do every year with the people that I meet is I, I am a, I'm really nerdy. I journal a lot. I go through my journal and I say, who are the top most in, who are the top three most influential leaders in my life this year that I met with? Maybe it was Mike Sullivan. Maybe it was so and so. And then I actually will write them a letter of why they were so influential. Even if they just did an interview with me, maybe they said something that changed the trajectory of my, of my life. Maybe one of their referrals uh, brought like open up a door that I, I could never open on my own. We, as a result, they become the most influential person. So I'll actually get resume paper, I'll either type it or write it, and this is kind of cheesy, but that's what I do. I'll burn the edges, so it's kind of cool. And then uh, if I can, I will set up a meeting with them. If I can't, I'll mail it to them. And, I, and basically the letter says, hey, every year I pick three people that have been extremely influential in my life, and you're one of them, and here's why. Do you know what that's going to do for them for the end of the year? Um, so I do that at the end of the year, and then beyond the top three, I do try to text or call other leaders that have made a difference, just as like a, hey, how are you doing? You'll be surprised how those little touches make an impact over time. Yes? So when you send it to them, you send all, all three of them on the page so they know who the other two are? No, I don't do that. You just send the third one or the three? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't know who the other three are. In fact, I don't publicize who the three are, because I feel like it's kind of weird too. For everyone else. But you were in the top three, sorry. <laughs> I know you spent hours with me, but it really didn't matter at all. Um, uh, acknowledge the impact that it made on your life publicly. This is something that I do, or like when I'm doing personal leadership lessons, I'll say, when I was interviewing this person, they taught me this. Or if you're speaking somewhere, like I always enter my, I talked about my father-in-law, but my father-in-law and my youth pastor were the two most influential men in my life. I try to honor them everywhere I go, saying without those two men, I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, and then ultimately, the biggest impact you can make for the leaders you meet with is to mentor the next generation. Again, every time I ask the leaders that I become friends with, how can I pay you back for the time you've invested, they always say the same thing. There's nothing you can give me, but if you do for someone in the next generation what I did for you, that's all the payback I need. And so um, add value to them. And then I put buy gifts, etc. Send them a little gift card at the end of the year. Again, just continually cultivate. It's what I do for fundraising too, right? The little touches. A call here, a text here, a gift here. A letter there, it all adds up. Um, and then final thoughts. I just put leaders, the leaders you meet with, whether or not you use them for a podcast or whatever, will take you further faster. Some leaders that you meet with in your life will be there, for, be there for long periods of your life, others for short. Be okay with that. Don't have unrealistic expectations of people. Um, don't be disappointed if you don't get a meeting with a mentor. Right? Don't hold it against them. Maybe it's a bad time. And no's not never. Maybe they can't meet with you in 2017, but maybe you can get on their calendar in 2018. 
always, always, always be grateful if someone's willing to meet with you. Not everyone gets opportunities like that. Not everyone gets opportunities like that. And then I put the best leaders are the ones that you end up getting to do life with. And if you have the opportunity to do life with leaders, where they actually invite you into their home, etc., just cherish those relationships with them so much. So that's a really big overview. We have a lot of time for Q&A. Um, but I'll just finish with the homework is create your bucket list of leaders that you want to meet with and ask five. Probably it's the weekend, so I, I tend not to make asks on weekends because it gets shuffled and lost. But on Monday morning, who are the five people you're going to send an invite to that you think are out of reach? And just try to get 15 minutes of their time. And again, if, if you write down your email address, I would love to hear. Like my favorite thing is when I give this talk and people email me and say, I got a meeting with this person. I can't believe it. Thank you. Um, I also, I guess this is selling, but I'm horrible at sales. Uh, but I wrote a book based on this called, I called it Making the Most of Mentoring. But it is my step-by-step -step process that I just shared with you in an easy Little, it's just a PDF of a document that has checklists and everything you need. So if that would be a resource for you, you can get it for 15 bucks on our website. Um, but yeah, that's it. So any questions or thoughts, I'd love to hear. And it could be about anything. You mentioned Cherry Coke and your leadership blog. In, in, in general, how, how do you go and think about values you could add when you're making your initial ad? So a Cherry Coke on my blog. I, so again, I think the value is I don't tell them, hey, I'm going to bring you cherry coke. But again, in researching them, so if, if I scheduled it through someone's assistant, or if I know someone, again, I go on LinkedIn. If I was interviewing you, I'd go on LinkedIn. Who are the connections? Do I know anyone that knows you? Hey, can you tell me something about them that, that they love, or a, a way that I could maybe be a blessing to them that they didn't think about? And the value you add to the person you want to meet with is saying that you'll be intentional with your time, that you want to learn from them. Everyone wants to teach everyone what they know, right? So it, it's an honor just to be asked to teach someone and spend time with someone. And then if you have a podcast or a blog, again, if you can tell people that you're not only going to benefit from it, but you'll also influence, and if you have specific examples. Oh, one thing I didn't mention, if you have a podcast, the best thing ever, well, referrals are the best source ever, right? If, if Mike Sullivan said, yeah, you can use my name to interview Jim Rutherford, that's a good day. Hey, Jim, Mike said I should interview you. Let's do it, right? That carries a lot more weight than just, hey, I. But what I also do, once now that I've established a decent network, in my emails, I'll say, hey. And I also do this. We have a monthly leadership breakfast series. So I do the exact same thing when I ask CEOs to speak at our events. I just say, hey, in the past, I'd like to ask you two things. One is I'd love to interview you for my podcast. Two, I'd love for you to speak at one of our leadership events. Here's people that I've had interviewed in the past. And based on who it is, I put different names in there, right? So in Mike Sullivan's case, Literally, the only reason I got the interview, one, I knew, my, I have a friend that's friends with the Penn's PR director, that's a plus. He met with her, I didn't even have to make the pitch, he met with her to catch up, and he said, listen, my friend Doug has this leadership organization, he's already interviewed, he, it's on his bucket list to interview Mike Sullivan, he's already interviewed Clint Hurdle and Mike Tomlin, so he needs Sullivan to finish the trifecta. So she emails me, and he did an email introduction, I said thanks, um, and she said, hey, after meeting with TJ, it makes perfect sense that we, the first priority when Mike gets back uh, from the summer is to finish the trifecta, right? And so I got that meeting, really. If had I not interviewed Hurdle and Tomlin, I don't know if I would have got that. So again, telling them who else you've interviewed is also extremely helpful. That's another way I value Because they say, oh, if they did it, I want to be in that. Anyway. Anyone else thoughts, questions? Uh, who failed to get? Who about failed to get? Uh, I'm trying to think. I literally, I've been told no twice. Okay, so my actually the number one bucket list interview it, for me is John Maxwell. I have no idea if you know who John Maxwell is, but he's my number one target. But I ended up interviewing his CEO, which is his number two guy. So that was awesome, and I'm still I still believe that I'm going to get that interview one day. Um, so I, he gave me a no. Uh, someone locally, Kim Fleming, the CEO of Hack Intelligent, she said no to an interview, but handed me up. She said, but someone great to interview would be my chief investment officer, so I interviewed him. And then she actually, for whatever reason, she didn't want to do an interview, but she did want to speak at a breakfast. So that no, even though that opportunity was a no, turned into a yes for another opportunity. So, yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, I don't even care. I'll just send it to all you guys for free. I'll just, if you sign up for their email, I'll just send you my whole e PDF. You don't even have to buy it. Really. I just, I use, unless you want to buy it, then that's awesome. <laughs> it's an e book, yeah. I used it as my, like, uh, your, like, my like, freebie to grow my email list. And people are like, that's a lot to give away for free, man. Like, this is like 40 pages or whatever. And it's, it literally will give you a meeting with anyone. And people are like, if people pay 15 bucks and it enables them to get a meeting with someone that they could never get a meeting with, like, that's worth value. But the whole, I mean, with L3, my biggest problem is I'm not a businessman. I'm more of like a ministry guy. I give everything away for free forever. I don't think you're making money. Although, wow. as my family grows, I'm thinking about that. Even though you give it away for free, it, it, that, it helps to deepen the relationship that you get ready to join the other things in your team. So, you know, it just, I value you and it's worth it. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, you have the follow-up question. So, you have the actual swipe that you can copy and save. Yeah. What's your conversion rate on that product? Oh man, it's probably horrible. I'm when, for the email list, it did really, really well. Now I haven't. I just switched it probably like three weeks ago to to selling it, which I haven't actually promoted even. Um, but I sold, I think, like one copy, which is awesome. How, how many people do you have on your mailing list? Like that? No, it's like 900. So, yeah. We have so we're a membership too, so you don't have to be a member of L3. But we have so we have 70 paying members. We just launched membership almost a year ago. So that's been interesting because again, I don't know how to make money, right? right? So membership has enabled us to make some money. Sponsorship for the podcast, is, uh, I got sponsorships on both ends. So if you have questions about that, I could do it. Um, we have sponsors for our breakfast events. We do events, so we get a little bit of event income. I do a lot of speaking, um, which also creates income. Um, and I hope to develop more products. So what what can you outline kind of the basics of your approach when there's somebody that you want to interview? Obviously, you talked about sending an email. Uh, do you follow up with a phone call at some point? Uh, or how, how do you generally start your approach? Yeah, always emails. I've, I've never had to have a phone call. Or, yeah, I've, I've never started with a phone call. Um, occasionally, someone that I ask will say, hey, can we jump on a call about this? Or can we grab lunch about this? Mm -hmm. But usually it's like, yeah. Here's my assistant, set it up. Or like, hey, let's go. Um, I know this isn't an arrogant statement, but like if you follow the process, I just feel I I've only been told no like once or twice. I've been doing this for five years. Um, so I don't know. But you do it mostly over email or all over mm -hmm. email exclusively. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when you're doing your actual uh, interviews, are you doing them face to face or through Skype or you guys do uh, like I used to do them on free conference calls. Yeah, so if it, if it's online, if they're out of state um, or national, I do Zoom, Zoom.us, which is great because it automatic. I think I pay the free version does this too, but only up to forty minutes. But for Zoom, it's like fifteen bucks a month, and it it automatically records. Like Skype, I had to download the call recorder and all that stuff, and it just it wasn't as good quality. But I found Zoom's my favorite. And then in person, if I get them in person, yeah, I. I well, I brought all my equipment today, so I can show you what I have. And then I've just started trying to do more video, but not too many freelancer videos when I do stuff for free. Right. Um, so, and now we're just getting to a place where we can pay freelancers, you know, 100 bucks a video or whatever. So, um, so I'm starting to record those videos. What was your startup cost as far as your video production? Uh, video. So I don't have any video equipment, Pro podcast wise. So. <clears throat> I have this Zoom recorder, which I think was 200 bucks. But I should say this: we'll talk about starting where you are. My wife bought me like a, a $50 little recorder, and, and you guys have phones too, right? So when I started, I didn't even know iPhones could record. I don't think it was in 2012. But I, you could start with that. Um, that's helpful. Recently, because I do events, um, I'm, I'm horrible at describing products because I'm not a techie. But basically, I just asked all my tech friends, like, hey, what should I have? There's a great resource. Uh, the guy's name's the Podcast Answer Man. It's Cliff Ravenscraft. If you have, he has three different product categories for podcasts, um, or three different price ranges. And he actually has classes. It's like 2000 bucks, but it's called Podcasting A to Z. That he'll walk you through every step and, and create you a world-class uh, podcast. I haven't gone through it, but I kind of look what he has. Um, and then I'll also ask around, like, a lot of this stuff was out of my price range. Right. So this is just, like, a wireless shore thing. I could send you – I do have links on L3's website of all of our resources. So you can go on there with affiliate links and just buy all the equipment that we have. And then for – so, like, I have a wireless 
uh, lapel system. That was like 500 bucks for two of them, I think. And then this is what Tim Ferriss recommends. Um, these are really cheap. These are like 70 or 80 bucks each. These are just um, Audio Technica ATR 2100s. They're USB mics. And so they can plug right into your computer, which create uh, and create create sound quality if you're doing a Zoom interview. Is it 21. Uh, and then I also bring these uh, to interviews in person if I don't have the wireless mics when I didn't have them, I should say. And then just a side note: if you do go with these, <laughs> I did this for a long time. Tim Ferriss said when I when I do interviews, he makes his guests hold these. It's a brilliant thought. I usually just set them up on these tripods. It was good, but it's a lot better if their voice is here. That makes sense. So cool. You mentioned you wanted to make more product. Like, what, what would you say is your key? I, I'm just curious because I actually do help people do that. Awesome. Um, what's your key differentiator? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, what do you think? Because if you're going to make your product line, you need to know that. So, yeah, so I, I would say I have two product. I have two brands, so to speak. I have Doug Smith, which is Doug Smith Live, because there's a billion Doug Smiths. And then L3 Leadership. Um, Doug Smith, so my plan. L3, we're continuing to grow mastermind groups. We have mastermind groups that meet all throughout the city. I think that differentiates us. Okay. And we have a monthly leadership breakfast series. And the network and the community of leaders that we've developed, I think, is a differentiator. That in and of itself is, is valuable. And then on Doug, the Doug Smith side, and, and with that, I should say, we're almost developing a franchise packet. So we're developing a mastermind training curriculum that anyone who wants to launch their own mastermind group can do that. So we'll do video content and training on that as well as a book. Um, and then we hope to long term, we have a whole membership site of our page, have tutorials and videos on leadership and different things like that. And then with Doug Smith, I want to write a book. And then with the book, do audio and video curriculum based on the book. And then have my own elite mastermind groups. And then ultimately for both, have a, a nine month leadership program um, that people pay big bucks to go through. So for your mastermind, is it going to be paid or is it going to be a free one? So right now, the way our, you have to become a member to be in a mastermind with L3 is 25 bucks a month, which is probably too cheap, but I started at 10, so I feel like I made some progress. Um, but yeah, and so and they meet all throughout our city. You join. If you're a, a member, you also get into our breakfast events for free, which is a great perk. And yeah. Yeah, but if you have any thoughts or feedback, I can do. Yeah, we, we can talk more out of it, like be more detailed questions, but you know, I guess the most feedback I'd say, if you're going to go release a product line, you should survey your customers who you already have because they've already spent money with you and find out, what, now that you solve one problem, what their other problems are. Once you know what their problems are, then you can create a product line. Ask them what the deliverable they want. Because I, I see right now audios would be something that would be powerful for your niche because a lot of people like to learn on books. They can go and they can drive around, they can hear all your stuff. So understanding uh, that factor, because I think you probably could charge much more for your leadership course. I have a friend who does the exact same thing in Canada, and her product is retailing at 197. Yours is really retailing at 15. I think you need to work on delivering your offer, strengthening your offer, and like I said, find out what the deliverable is that they want. And if you do that, then you can stack it together and layer it. And the other thing would be conversion. So that you can build up your joint venture network. You mentioned the word affiliate. That's why I'm sharing it. Uh, with this strategy, it's very similar to what I would do to teach somebody or what I've done in the past to attract different affiliates or promote them. Is it clear with that? Mm -hmm. mention? So if you know what your conversion rate is, one of the quickest ways you can increase your customer list is to actually use your system to attract those JVs. That's why you need to know your conversion. We should chat, man. Absolutely. I'll, I'll send you an email saying, can we get together? Yeah. Absolutely. I'd love to. So, so you had uh, you had mentioned you had, you had mentioned Zoom is the product you use for just international calls or any calls? Uh, any any online video calls. That's my go-to. Online video calls. Okay. Yeah. And you're able to record both the audio and the video. Is that audio cool? video? It automatically extracts right afterwards, and it'll okay. go into a folder on your desktop. Audio alone, video alone, well, video and audio combined, obviously, mm -hmm. which is super awesome. You could do share screen. I mean, you could do. Anything that you need to do, you can use it for. Okay. Is is uh? How do you are you? You're obviously comfortable with the quality, or else you wouldn't be using it. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I so. so I have an iMac at home, and then mm -hmm. but I heard the iMac camera's not that great, so I forget. I can send you the link to what I bought, 
but there was some like HP high definition camera that I ended up buying that's like excellent, excellent quality. And then I just bought two, I don't even know what they cost, like $25 LED lights. So it shines on my face. So I mean, even if I'm just doing a video call, like the quality looks really good on my face. There's no shadows, uh, sure. et cetera. Sure. And uh, in terms of, is it, a, is it a paid product, I assume, or no? They have a free version. The only difference between free and paid, at least that I'm aware of, again, I don't go into the weeds, but is you only can record 40 minutes if, uh, if on the free version, the, the paid version, you can do as much as you want. And it's really cool because that you can set up your own meetings in there and reoccurring meetings, mm -hmm. and then it just creates a link and an actual calendar invite that you can just send to people, and they just they can join by phone, they can join however they want. But you found it's better than Skyping. I, I think it's better than Skype. I prefer it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. We have five minutes, but we can end early, or if anyone else has any questions or thoughts. Well, I'm I'm interested in uh, hearing more uh, from your your book about how you get the interviews. So. Yeah. yeah, great. Um, well, if you guys want to connect, if you didn't get notes, oh uh, yes. I was going to say, who were the say five people that you're looking to connect with? Because you never know who somebody in this room knows that can help you. Uh, locally. Sure. Why not? Uh, you never know who people know. John Maxwell is number one. Um, yeah, my my list is pretty full. So the problem becomes. Once your your bucket list is full, right. it's just like man, there's like an endless amount. I'd say Jim Rohr is someone I'm trying to connect with. I do have a referral out to him, where someone knows him personally. That would be great. I mean, I, I would basically, I probably a better question is who do you guys know that I should know, right? That's probably the best question because you guys can actually list people versus me trying to guess who you know. So if you know anyone that you're like, if you haven't interviewed this person or had this person speak, I'm I'm all open. I haven't. Education, education and government world, I haven't interviewed that many people. I'm good on athletics. I'm good on um, just like leadership in general businesses. I've had a lot of CEOs. Diversity is a big issue for me. Um, I'm not racist or anything, obviously, but I had a leader uh, who was Turkish, and he said, hey, how many women have you interviewed? And at the time, this was very early on, I had interviewed no women. And he just shook his head. I'm like, oh, man. You know, and then I started... So just diversity in general. So anyone that you guys know that I can interview that's diverse would be awesome. I love highlighting leaders that are diverse. Do you talk to a lot of people in the nonprofit world or in the community that you've been doing nonprofit work? Yeah, I love nonprofit leaders. So. <coughs> Any other questions on how to build your platform or anything? So one of the things you said that I picked up was your big takeaway was your upfront contract. What are some examples you mentioned time, which is very valuable as an upfront contract, what are some other variables that you take into account in the upfront contract? Yeah, uh, again, it's just telling them and getting them to agree on what you want the meeting to look like. Um, so, for instance, probably, so I learned that through a sales training that I did through Sandler Training, and it was so interesting. One of the trainers came and he wanted a tour of Light of Life, and I did not do an upfront contract. So I, I end up, we met for coffee for like 20 minutes, and I gave him a tour of the mission. And at the end of the, the tour of the mission, he said, hey, can I give you some feedback? And I said, yeah. He goes, number one, you didn't do an upfront contract, so I had nothing to agree on. Now, granted, it's their principle, right? But he said, I, I, he's like, all I'm interested in that you guys do a light of life is chapel. I would like to teach at a chapel service. Um, and he goes, so you just gave me a tour of your whole building, told me about all the programs. Like, pretty much, I'm not going to lie to you. Like, that was a waste of my time. If you would have just up front said, hey, what do you want to accomplish today? In this case, it was letting him set the agenda. In my cases, it's me setting the agenda. But hey, what do you want to accomplish today? He would have said, hey, I just want to meet with you for five minutes to get to know you. But, and then I'd like to, you to show me the chapel and teach me how to get involved with that. And I would have been out of there. Instead, I took an hour of his time. So if it's their agenda, it's letting them run that. If it's your agenda, it's it. that's why the list of questions is important. Hey, you agreed to 15 minutes. Here's the questions that I send, and I always print out two copies if I'm meeting them in person. I give them a copy, and I just say, um, hey, are there any questions that, that I put on there that you're not comfortable asking? Hey, I want to let you know that if you say anything uh, that you don't want to say, I will not post it. I'm not like the media. I'm not going to twist what you like. I'll just take it out completely. Um, yeah, I just practice like that. Is there anything that you would want me to ask that I didn't ask? Those are usually my interview with them. Yeah. Anyone else? 
Awesome. Well, if you guys want to connect and want me to email you, if you just found one of those connect cards, some of you I handed out, so we may not have them. And then those other sheets there, they're for notes, but it has all of our contact and social media info on if you want to connect that way. And I sincerely mean if there's any way I can add value to you outside of this, let me know. Thank you so much for attending. <laughs> That's awesome.